Uh, thank you all for coming to uh, today's workshop. Uh, it's supposed to be on uh, Grover's algorithm. I think someone uh, you asked earlier, uh, what is Grover's algorithm? Well, now, I'm, now you're here and I can, I can spill the beans. So let me go ahead and hit um, the present thing here. So Mark, can you still see that on Zoom? Yep. Awesome. Now actually, hold on, I'm gonna have some fun here. There we go. Woohoo, a little laser pointer. So yeah, this is all, this workshop on Grover's algorithm. So if you don't know what it is, don't worry, I'll, I'll get to it as well as all the other technicalities. So I have the sort of the objectives that I wanna cover. Um, once again, I'm, I'm hoping to keep things uh, hybridized. So you have like a code interactive component that'll be something for you to mess around with and, and, and get like a hands-on feel for. But in the very beginning, I'll give like a high level overview of how the algorithm works. And I'll leave it to you guys to look at all the, um, all the math and, and all the derivations because I, I used to um you know doodle it on the um, on this little board here and then I realized like one my handwriting looks like shit and two it's probably much more uh, much more fruitful for you guys if I just give you the, the big idea and then I'll let you kind of munch in all the uh, smaller tidbits there so the goal is uh um you know what does Grover's algorithm do uh, what's it good for um, how does it work so that's the high level stuff and uh, some of the the Jupiter notebooks so just like last time we had the um, notes fill the Deutsch Hose stuff. So this time around, I have notebooks, plenty of notebooks, by the way. I've, I've had like a lot of um, stuff prepped. Um, it's a shame there was, a, I don't know, there's someone here saying like wanted like more interactive stuff and they're not here. So uh, anyways, uh, so, uh, you know, all of these algorithms are, are designed to solve some kind of problem. That's just the inherent nature of, of any algorithm. And the problem is, uh, so let's imagine I give you a bunch of items and they're in no particular order. In fact, a lot of times when you learn about Grover's algorithm, one of the terms they'll throw around very uh, nonchalantly is unstructured search. So what exactly that means is um, the all the items I've given you have no pattern to them. They're not or arranged in alphabetical order or numerical order or any sort of order, just you know randomly in a in a pile. Uh, so in the worst case, uh, you know how long would it take for you to find what you wanted? Well, if it's a bunch of random items, the worst case is you have to look at every single item to the nth item. That's what big O of n means. That's the worst case scenario. Um, but you know, now I ask, you know, is there a, a way to make this faster? And intuitively, this doesn't seem possible because you know it, it's uh, at this point, you know, that's where the quantum weirdness kind of kicks in. And I can tell you that yes, we, we can do better than um, the worst case scenario, which is like looking at all n items. And uh, yes, according to Grover's al al algorithm, we do have a, a possible speed up. In fact, we can do it in O of square root of n, which is very weird because it, it, classically speaking, that's almost like if you only look at a the square root of the number of items in your stack. And you can figure out like, okay, I just found the item I wanted, which is, uh, you know, classically speaking, it's very odd. Uh, that's a, a quadratic speed up. And so, so you know, uh, you think quadratic, how about I ask, can we do better than a quadratic speed up? Because, you know, in, in the history of computer science, what happens is someone finds an algorithm and then another computer scientist says like, hey, there's a, a trick we can use here. And, and, you know, it's the same thing in quantum computing too. I mean, even in the field of work that I do with uh, graph isomorphisms, it's interesting to see people um, iterate on that work and, and, and make like faster algorithms that are more resource efficient. And it turns out that in, in January of 1997, uh, there is proof that O of square root of N is as fast as you can get with this kind of unstructured search problem. You can go no further, no better than O of uh, square root of N. Um, if you're really curious about it and you go on um, Wikipedia, apparently there's a way to get O of the cube root of N, but that involves some kind of uh, weird setup. It's like a, a minor footnote. I have to check the source on that. You know, remember when you, you're looking at Wikipedia, always make sure you double check those, um, those footnotes. And oh yeah, I have some sources for you guys. The slides will always be up on the website. I encourage you to look at these, um, these sources. I mean, I, by, by no means am I like the you know, super genius here. I mean, I'm, I'm consulting like 10 or 20 different sources to try and pick out um, the information I think will be most useful and, and most friendly for you to understand. So this is, this is a formal definition of the problem. So in an unstructured search problem, so given a, a set of n elements forming a set of x, so from x1 to xn, so that's the, that's the um, bunch of random items I gave you, and there's a, a Boolean function. So all this function does is it takes any x and it, it gives you a zero or it gives you a one. Um, the goal is to find an element, x star, so that's like the, the, uh, uh, the item we're looking for, that's the solution. Uh, and it, f of x will give us one if it's the solution and zero otherwise. That's it, that's all f of x does. f of x, um, and, and I put this here on the bottom, uh, f of x can be a function that we define to recognize solutions of a problem of interest. I remember in the very beginning, there was someone on the Zoom call uh, who asked, you know, because I, I brought up Grover's algorithm as a, a benefit of quantum computing. 
And, and he asked, well, you know, wait a minute. It, it feels like in some of the examples for Grover's algorithm that you already know the answer. So it doesn't kind of defeat the point of, of having this algorithm. And it turns out that there is a, a distinction between having a function that calculates the answer and having a function that just recognizes the answer. Uh, so another way you can think about Grover's algorithm is uh, we can take a function that takes some binary output and we can invert it. So uh, if, if we have, um, like, you know, say I have y equals f of x and I know what y is, I can find what, what x is. So I can go backwards if I know what my, um, if I give you the answer and I need to find like the, uh, the x that gives me y, that can be done. Ah, okay, so here's, here's, what I go, uh, here's what I was blabbering about earlier, um, recognizing versus computing solutions. So for a problem of interest, um, we don't need f of x to actually do any heavy lifting. They're not too much heavy lifting, at least. Uh, we, we design f of x so that it can tell us that it's a solution to our problem. It, it doesn't, you know, really, it, it does some calculation, but it, it's supposed to be very efficient because all we're doing is checking for the answer. Uh, and the example that I give you um, of the difference between like computing and, and recognizing a solution is one that gets cited. Um, Nielsen and Twan mentioned it. I think pretty much every source on the internet that talks about Grover's algorithm will use um, this example, which is the finding the prime factors of a number. Uh, so to just recognize that there are two valid prime factors, all that f of x has to do is multiply the two numbers together. That's a very trivial thing for a computer to do, even more trivial for a quantum computer and, and easy for us to do even on pen and paper. It's very easy to check if two numbers multiply to a bigger number, but it is significantly harder to uh, figure out if I just give you the number to figure out the, the two largest you know, prime factors for that number. But we don't need f of x to compute that for us. We just need f of x to do the multiplication. Because uh, another way you can think of Grover's is we're actually like brute forcing. Uh, like that O of N, the, the worst case scenario where you have, you have to check everything is almost, it's pretty much the equivalent of brute forcing. I'm just plugging in like, is zero a prime? No, only one. Of, and then you go all the way to, um, and it's kind of like that scene from uh, one of the old Mr. Bean movies where they, they can't tell the phone number of the kid. So he has to punch in every single phone number. And it turns out he actually misses the right phone number. So I waste all his time. Like it's, it's a, I don't even remember the name of the movie. Anyways, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the, the key point that I want you to remember is f of x doesn't compute the function. It just recognizes the, the solution. It, it, that solution will satisfy some criteria to, uh, inter that's of interest to us. Ah, okay. So what you know, now, now that you kind of know what Grover's algorithm does, it, it lets us like kind of invert functions and, and um, uh, yeah, that, that's the right way to think about it. Uh, there's this kind of this, uh, this is by Scott Aronson. Oh, see, I'm missing the name here, but the link's there. I'll give myself partial credit. But uh, uh, Scott Aronson says that we can obtain a, a polynomial speed up for any NP complete problem. So the, the polynomial speed up, if you remember earlier, I said worst case in, in our world is O of n, but for the quantum computer, it's square root of n. We can consider that a, a polynomial speed up. And uh, for any NP complete problem, uh, if, you, if you come from a computer science background, NP complete, NP, P, um, all that stuff is very familiar, but I know we have a very interdisciplinary audience and I think it's worth taking some time to explain um, what does NP complete actually mean? So that's why I call this a, a detour through a complexity theory. So if there's one thing that people in, in CS love, it's, it's categorizing problems. And, and people in CS categorize problems based on uh, resource consumption growth relative to the size of the problem. So what I mean by that is, you know, if I, if I make the problem some unit larger, than uh, it used to be. And I look at how the time, uh, the time grows. Time is a resource, memory is a resource. Um, uh, usually the, the most popular is time, but memory uh, comes up as well. In quantum computing, we care about the number of gates, which is almost like the equivalent of number of operations that the quantum computer needs. So for, um, for problems in P, we say that they can be solved in, in polynomial time. And, and you can find the solution. You can verify the solution in, in polynomial time as well. It, it's very easy stuff. NP, um, that's what NP means, by the way. NP does not mean not P. I thought that was a situation for the longest time. It turns out it means um, a non-deterministic polynomial. Don't worry about where the non-deterministic comes from. That's like another area of, of, uh, uh, of CS theory that I'm intentionally protecting you guys from. You can go down the rabbit hole. Uh, but the idea is that you can still check if the solution is correct in polynomial time. But I can no longer guarantee for you that we can find the solution in polynomial time. So that's, we consider that NP. NP, uh, inside NP, we have problems that are known as NP-complete problems. So what that means is the problem itself is NP, 
But if I give you a little extra time, you can translate any other problem in NP to that particular problem. So, um, so yeah, if the problem is an NP and there are other problems in NP, then with some polynomial overhead, um, I can translate one problem to the other problem. And you might think, well, you know what, what's the, what's the benefit of doing that? Well, if you have an algorithm that may, you know, solve that NP complete problem uh, pretty efficiently, then we can, you know, it might be worth translating uh, your other problem that's NP and, and getting it into the NP complete problem. Um, uh, that's the and that's the hope at least. Although the, the interesting thing is if there were a way to calculate one NP complete problem efficiently, it turns out that all the other problems NP kind of collapse um, in terms of complexity. Um, and it's this, it, it, it's the very famous P equals NP question because of a, a lot of computer scientists for decades have asked whether or not it's possible that the problems in P and the problems in NP are actually the same category. We haven't figured out, um, you know, maybe a, uh, maybe because all you need is one problem. All you need to do is figure out how to solve one problem in NP efficiently. And then the whole thing um, turns all into P. But, but for the past for several decades, we haven't been able to figure that out. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an open question. It's not even on my slide. I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's uh, um, something I think is very cool. So here's some uh, applicable problems. I mentioned NP complete problems. Uh, if you don't know who uh, uh, Carp is, another famous uh, computer scientist and uh, not a fish, but uh, a CARP has a list, uh, 21 NP complete problems. Um, uh, so it's, it, it, I think he publishes this somewhere in the 70s. And this is like the first case of, of all these like NP complete problems. And uh, you know, it, it doesn't, NP complete doesn't really make much, um, doesn't have much of an impact to us as normal people. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying like, you know, he's, you know, people who work in quantum computing or computer scientists are weird or anything, but um, a lot of problems you see in industry in, in science and, and technology and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, once again, uh, they have their roots in, in uh, being NP problems or NP complete. So if we have a way to efficiently solve these problems, then that's you know, kind of a benefit that can spread out. Um, so, uh, from, so from Kiskit and the example that I want you guys to investigate is uh, known as 3SAT or, or KSAT. Uh, and the, the idea is we have some kind of formula that has a bunch of Boolean variables. So Boolean just means it can either be true or false. And the idea is I can string a bunch of these variables together. So I can say like X and not Z or Y, just you know, string a bunch of them together. And that, that, that can represent um, in industry, a lot of optimization problems. I think scheduling is, um, is one of them. I'll have, to, I'll have to pull up a source to be sure. But SAT and uh, uh, KSAT uh, come up a bunch. Although the reason for the, the difference in, in number here is these uh, Boolean satisfaction problems have a certain format and the number just represents like, uh, you can think of it on a high level, just how many variables you can lump together in, in one term almost. Um, there's also the maximum clique problem. Uh, maximum clique, uh, I don't know how familiar you guys are with, uh, with graph theory, um, but the, the bit, uh, I, can, I can make this quick. Uh, so if you imagine, like, let's imagine we're, we're all like in a, a, a group of friends, right? Well, just, a, I, know it's, I know it's weird, but just you know, bear with me here. So we're all like a, a nice group of friends. And it turns out that uh, maybe four out of out of all of us, four of us consistently talk with each of the other three people in that set of four. So that means we consider that a, a clique. It's when like uh, all the um, all the elements are are connected to each other. Every other node's connected to every other one. Uh, a maximal clique or a maximum clique is the largest clique you can get because you can have a clique of uh, you know three nodes. That's a that's a triangle essentially, but it's a small one. It's not the biggest one. So out of out of our, our group of people, if, if we had like a clique with uh, you know five people, so that means that every every person has a, a connection to all the other four people. We consider that a, a maximum clique. That is an NP complete problem, and it turns out that it has uh, the following applications, such as uh, matching three D molecular structures. Uh, this comes up in, in pharmacology, uh, patterns in, in telecommunications traffic. So like on, on social networks, um, that's like the kind of the friend example I gave you. I know Facebook is probably doing millions of you know cliques and recommending you. Um, friends, I, I would assume that's part of their algorithm, and a fault diagnosis for large multiprocessor systems. I'm not even quite sure how that works, but it was in the report. It's been cited here, and uh, combinatorial optimization problems. Um, this is a, an area that I'm very familiar with, just because my work is in uh, is, is sort of is sort of related to that field. But the basic idea with CO problems is um, if I give you a, a set of objects, and there's some optimal way to pick from that set of objects or to arrange that set of objects, we consider that a, a combinatorial optimization problem. So uh, Grover's algorithm can provide a, a speed up for all of these problems. 
And it's, it's a speed up. It's not meant to, it's not going to make P equals NP. It's not going to happen with broker, but it is, it's, it's nice to have. So I'm going to give you an overview of how this algorithm works. It, it's, it's a particularly elegant algorithm. In fact, I, um, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice to, what am I, what am I mumbling about? It, it, it is, it's a nice algorithm. <laughs> So the, in, in our first step, we're going to set um, all the possible solutions in, in an equal superposition. So if you remember Deutsch Hose, what we did was we just put a bunch of Hadamards. And the Hadamards, like starting from, from the zero state, so all the qubits are in zero, slap a Hadamard on it, and it becomes like you know, one over the root two, zero plus one over root two, one. So we get them all. So there's an equal chance. All these answers have an equal chance of showing up. Now, we're going to have an oracle. And the oracle, once again, the oracle is the function I was talking about. The oracle is going to flip. It's going to flip the phase of the solution. Don't worry if all, if all this stuff I'm telling you right now doesn't really make sense verbally. I have pictures. So um, you'll have something that's nice for your, um, I guess, your visual cortex to munch on. Now, this, this is the heart of Grover's algorithm, inversion about the mean. That's how we actually get the, um, uh, we get closer and closer to the right answer. And, and the way you define closer is that the probability of measuring the answer increases, whereas the probability of measuring the wrong answers decreases. So we squash the other ones and we let the, the one with the higher chance come up. And we're going to repeat. We repeat two and three. Rinse and repeat. So you just you just keep applying it. Um, and there, there, but you don't want to apply it forever. It's not one of those algorithms where you let it run longer and longer and you get closer and closer to the answer. In fact, it turns out uh, I'll, I'll get to the caveat section. There's a bit of a there's a bit of a problem when it comes to running Grover indefinitely. I won't, I won't spoil it now. Um, so so how many times should you run you know two and three? If I say rinse and repeat and I say like well it's bad to let it run forever, uh, it turns out you run it approximately pi over four times uh, the square root of n times. And if you're wondering where that comes from, it's a very weird number, pi over four to this, times the square root of n. It turns out there is, there's something that I omitted from this presentation and, and from this workshop. There's a geometrical interpretation of Grover's algorithm um, where you can, you can represent um, the system as like two vectors. And you do a number of specialized rotations and you rotate to the correct vector answer. That's, that's a geometrical view. I opted not to show you guys that because it's just, um, I wasn't too happy with all the answers, I, all the presentations I found, it, because I'm not, not to teach you guys extra trigonometry and stuff like that. And quite frankly, I think, um, I think the explanation I'll give you will be sufficient for your purposes. But uh, yeah, and then at the very end, you, you perform a measurement. So we're gonna destroy the superposition state. And ideally at the, at the measurement, we will get the um, right answer with very high probability. So let's go ahead and, and look at those pictures I was talking about. They should be um, helpful. It's uh, 650, okay, cool. Um, uh, near the end, I'll, I'll give you time to just look at the notebooks. And, um, and if you see like the rendering error I saw earlier, let me know, I can push out a fix like right now. Uh, so so in, in this particular case, uh, I'm only doing two qubits. So that means we have a total of four possible answers to look at. So when I apply the Hadamard, um, we go from, from the zeros. Oh, whoops, hold on, uh, I'm trying to laser pointer. So we, we go from the, the all zero state, and now every answer has an equal chance of showing up. In fact, these are what the bars show. Um, the the 0 0.5 is, is I, all I did was I took the... Um, the uh, probability amplitudes here, and I, I graphed it out. So, um, so yeah, so, so they're all at equal um, equal chances. The red bar here is what I want you to pay a little attention to. That's the average. So I took all the, um, like this one over uh, square root of four. So it's just one over two. Uh, I did one over two plus one over two plus one over two plus one over two. And I took the, the average of that. So right now, you know, nothing nothing fishy. So far it's, it's, it's a home territory. Now I'm going to apply the Oracle and the Oracle recognizes which one of these inputs is the, is the correct answer. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna flip, it's gonna flip the phase. So in the beginning, we were all, uh, all positive valued amplitudes. Now, uh, I picked zero as the answer here. Um, now you notice that zero is, is you know, facing the other way. It's, it's been flipped upside down, whereas all the other ones are um, still in the same position they were. But you'll also notice that the, the, the mean, the mean of the amplitudes has been reduced. So earlier it was at 0 0.5, and now I've brought it down to you know in between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4. If you don't know how, how the um, Oracle does this, 
Um, and this is why I was like, you know, you're probably wondering like, why did John like say like a phase kickback 10 million times? Well, that's, that's why, because um, at Grover's algorithm, we use phase kickback to literally um, apply a negative phase to the target answer. So um, this, this notation should look somewhat familiar. This is, um, I use this in the Deutsch Hose example. So we, we flip the answer and you notice the mean, the mean has changed now. So now we get to do the um, fun stuff, which is apply inversion about the mean. And don't worry if the, the math here, like I, I don't expect you to digest or, or even make sense of all the math, but I will point out what I want you to understand. So to perform inversion about the mean, there's a special operator on um, Grover's operator. In fact, it's usually called the Grover diffusion operator. Um, and it looks like this. Mathematically, it, it looks like this. And, and if, you, if you remember, um, I tell you guys that the, the ket times a bra, that's just another matrix. It's just another matrix. But this time, the, um, the size here are all the equal, equal superposition states. So, you know, zero, uh, 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 it's just an equal superposition of all the basis states. And we're going to apply the operator to an, an arbitrary state. So in this case, the arbitrary state in question is, is in the summation here, um, because you can represent uh, any, any quantum state as just the sum of your basis states. And I want you to pay attention to what happens to the, the a sub i here. a sub i is the probability amplitude in front of that basis ket. The a sub i goes from, you know, from just being whatever the hell it was. And now, it has, now this thing gets applied. It's two times um, the mean. So you remember earlier that red line is the mean. So multiply that times two. And then we subtract the older amplitude from it. And this will literally flip. It's going to flip our, um, our values uh, over the mean. So inversion about the mean. Um, and, and yeah, so note that the, um, the a with the two triangles on the a, that's just how we denote. Um, the average of all the probability amplitudes. And if, if, if that still sounds very abstract, don't worry, I've got plenty more pictures. When I first learned it, it sounded very abstract. So, um, so yeah, so, so here's, yeah, so this is what I was talking about. So, so this, this A sub I is the probability associated with a certain answer. And then when I apply the, the Grover operator, um, it turns into this, so two times the mean minus the amplitude. And I want you to recognize that it, this is the equivalent of saying this. There's no, there's no disagreement there. Um, it, all I did was I split the mean like this, but, but you'll notice that now you can kind of see better what's going on here. You take the difference from the mean and then you add it back to the mean and you get your new amplitudes. Just take the difference and add it back to the mean. That's all we're doing. And uh, oh, so, so I took this little trick comes from uh, Umesh Vazirani actually. Vazirani is one of the huge names. Um, in, in quantum computing. So, um, and he has like some, some YouTube lectures online. I don't think he uploaded them though. It's kind of, it's kind of fishy, but um, they're up there. So, so I encourage you to uh, check it out if you can. And so notice here, I said, figure out if you're above or below the average. So what I've done is I've broken down the different cases and we're gonna see how the operator behaves on those different cases. So case 1A, we have a probability that's a little below the average. It's not less than zero. It's not negative. It's still positive, but it's just a, it's just a little bit below zero. So, so the average. So these numbers, by the way, are impossible. If you have a quantum state that has numbers like these, you've really got to recalibrate that computer, or you're doing something wrong. But um, so I, I just. But I'm just using nice round numbers to make it easier to see what's going on. The logic is is still the same here. So the average here is three, but the amplitude on a particular answer is two. So if I if I do the math here, you know, three minus two is one. And then we're going to add that difference to the mean to give us to give us four, and as a result, we're now one over the mean. So we were under the mean earlier, and now we've literally flipped over by one unit. So here's a picture. Um, you can tell I, I doodled this myself. If I was a little more proficient with LaTeX, I could have rendered this. And, and you know, some of the notes out there are gorgeous, but I'm definitely not um, there yet. So I used the, I used one note for this. But but this is what we were, were in the beginning. Um, this cat with the the um, very terrible. Um, phi in it. it is just, you know, I'm just saying this is a random state. So don't, don't worry about the value. But in the beginning, we have a sub i, which is at um, two here. And then the mean is at three. And I apply the operator. I apply the operator. And now we're, we're one over. So I've just bumped. I've just bumped the probability amplitude from being below the mean to being above it. In case 1b, uh, really below average, like some of my prior class scores. But um, uh, when we do that phase flipping, you notice that there are amplitudes that go below zero. I'll, I'll go back to uh, right here. Yeah, see, the, see now th this is below, this is negative. So intuitively, if you think, well, if we're a little below the average, when we go a little above the average, and if we're really below the average, then we should go really above the average. 
and you're right. So if I, so we're still, we still have the mean of three, but I let this equal negative one. So, so we're below zero. And I do the um, subtracting here, three minus negative one, that's four. And then I add that to the mean. You know, now, now it's seven. So we're four over the mean. And it's, it's quite a remarkable, like this is a huge um, increase in the, in the probability amplitude. And that's what we mean by inversion about the mean, it's literally flipping the amplitude um, over the mean. And then, of course, I have an example here. This is the last case where we're over the average. So let's imagine that the average is three, but a sub i is, is four. And we find out, you know, doing this subtraction that it's, it's minus one. So our new probability amplitude is, is two. So now we were, we were over the mean by one. And now we've dropped. We've dropped by one. So now, now we've literally flipped um, down the mean. So if, if I take the, uh, this state here and I apply inversion about the mean, it, we can just think about this intuitively. Well, these guys, this is over by some amount. So we, 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 if we flip it, this guy goes to zero. All these go to zero. So intuitively, that means that all this amplitude has been kind of pushed to the, the proper answer here. And this is, you can tell this is a huge difference from the mean. So that must mean that when we flip back up, it's also going to be a, a huge uh, increase in amplitude. So, boom, look at that. Now zero, which I said was the answer earlier, is the only thing you can measure. All the other answers have been you know, annihilated. We only have zero here. Um, this is the two qubit example. Um, and you notice I only had to apply the operator once. If I have three or more qubits, you'll have to apply the operator more times. In fact, I mentioned earlier, it's pi over four um, over the square root of n times. Roughly that amount. You have to like round down or up because it's pi over four. But that'll give you a good ballpark estimate of where, how many times you need to um, apply this operation. So for two qubits, I think after one operation, you're pretty much guaranteed the, um, the right answer. Ah, now I have the caveats. Um, you know, I'm not trying to sell you guys snake oil. I'm not a, a quantum hype man. I'm, I'm here to tell you as it is. So uh, if you apply the operation I showed you, the version about the mean, too many times, you actually get further from the right answer. Um, Scott Aronson has a, a very fun little analogy with cooking. Um, it's not bread. I forgot. It's like not fondue. I don't know what it is. But um, he says, like, you know, like when you when you cook bread, you know, bread rises and you cook you cook it like too long and it starts falling back down or something. Or maybe you burned it. And then, but he says, like in the quantum example, if you keep it longer, it just oscillates to get closer and further, closer and further from the answers. You keep applying that inversion about the mean that I was telling you about earlier. Oh, someone in someone in chat has a question. Souffle, yes, Kirk, uh, Kirk McGregor, um, he's got it right. The example that Scott Aronson gave was souffle. If you, you know, if you put in, you know, if you're cooking it and you, get, you put it in the oven for too long, the souffle will, will rise and then it'll fall. But uh, apparently this souffle repeatedly rises and falls instead of getting burnt. Um, oh, whoops. Thanks, Kirk. Uh, but there's also another thing I want you to notice is I, I, I kind of said like, oh, okay, we can just turn f of x into an oracle. And there's a bit of a, an asterisk you have to put next to the, that statement. Because to do that requires me to take the problem and translate it in, into something the quantum computer can understand. And this, this is from a paper from, I think, Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, and they, they said, you know, but keep in mind that an inefficient oracle construction can nullify any practical advantages gained by using Grover search. So if my oracle takes like a, you know, takes a huge amount of gates or ridiculously long amount of time to check the answer, you're not really going to get any benefit from it. So you got to make sure that when you are implementing an oracle, you want it to be as, as you know, compact and as fast as possible. So those are the um, oh, caveats for you. Oh, what's going on here? Oh, yeah. And uh, some additional info. In that example I gave you, I, I gave a very friendly example because it only has one answer. F of X only has one answer. But in the real world, you might have a, a black box or an F of X that has multiple answers. So does, does Grover's algorithm work for that? And I'm very happy to say the answer is yes. In fact, um, the complexity, the time complexity for when we have multiple answers is, is uh, better, if, if you think about it, because now there are, there are two, um, uh, two, uh, vec or, or two solutions that get the phase invert, and as a result, we converge faster to two possible solutions. So it's n over um, root k queries. A query just means we're invoking the oracle. We apply the oracle. That's what it means when we um, say query. So it's the square root of n over k. And I mentioned the, um, uh, how many times you should apply the operator is like, pi over four times uh, uh, the square root of n over uh, uh, square root of n. Now it's just pi over four times the square root of n over k, because the k is the number of uh, uh, possible solutions. 
Uh, before I go any further, now there's, there's probably a, a uh, uh, for those of you that are very observant, you probably have noticed there's something I'm, I'm not being honest with here. How do we, how do you know ahead of time how many answers f of x has? That's a, you know, in the real world, you may have problems that you, you don't know the, ahead of time, <coughs> excuse me, the number of possible solutions. And it turns out uh, there's, a, there's actually an algorithmic way. It, it is very much in some sense like brute forcing, but you're using Grover's algorithm where you, you pick k to be a powers of two, I think. That was on the Microsoft um, uh, uh, Azure page. And, and it turns out that if you do that, um, it's still efficient. Um, it, it's, it's definitely overhead, but it's still efficient. And um, that's how you can, you can randomly pick a proper K to try and go with. So uh, I, think, I think I have it in the notebooks. Um, you'll see that. And then uh, implementing the algorithm. OK, cool. I've, I've blabbered on long enough. I think it's time to let you guys you know, have some fun with some, some code and some actual, uh, uh, some actual uh, actually rigorous content, I guess. So let me go ahead and end this slide here. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a brief overview of what these notebooks look like. And then I'll, I'll show you the URL and, and let you guys download it and, and install it. And, and while I'm here, um, if you have technical issues, don't hesitate to uh, uh, you know, just, just bug me. Because I mean, I, I built these. It's, it's my obligation to make sure they work on your systems. So I do have uh, an index here. Uh, the index, it's almost like a table of contents. So I've, I've arranged all these on um, this prerequisite knowledge I didn't cover in the last workshops. So now I've crammed it all into these notebooks. And um, so, you know, stuff with like uh, controlled gates because we'll need these kinds of gates. And you can see there's some rendering error. This is supposed to be like an actual arrow, but for some reason my latex is uh, misbehaving. Uh, but the, uh, so I just, you know, this is just some preliminary information on some different possible um, control gates here. And you'll notice my treatment in terms of the math was intentionally light because uh, I've put all the labor of showing the math um, in here. Uh, so, so, you know, how to mathematically apply the operator as well as how to derive it. So the, the derivation for it. So, so, because, you know, you might be thinking, um, you know, how the heck does, uh, uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. Yeah. How the heck do we go from, from this to getting the, this behavior, you know, the, uh, you know, going from, you know, a sub i to, you know, two times the mean minus a sub i. Uh, you know, I, I intentionally omitted that from, from, you know, me just blabbering on, but I've written what I think is a helpful explanation um, in this notebook. So there's, there's plenty of, of, of math here. And I, um, th this is, I want you to think of this more as like a, because this is another professor's work out there. I just annotated, I've added some comments that I think would be helpful for you guys to um, figure out. Because a lot of times, you know, the, these courses are oriented towards like grad students. And they omit, you know, many, uh, many a number of steps uh, for the sake of brevity. And then from there, I also have. Uh, so you remember those nice, nice diagrams? Well, here they are. So you can go ahead and figure out how I generated those diagrams and and see the see the process for yourself. And I have a section here. This is the fun little thing: overdoing it. So you remember, like I, I told you, it's very important that you don't apply the Grover operation too many times. What exactly does it look like? When you apply it too many times, well, we're, let, let's say like we start from here. We're already at our answer, right? You know, why bother applying it again? And let's say you know maybe I went for a coffee break, and I, I you know I let the intern um, uh, you know write the code, and he decided like oh you know maybe if I put some more operations it'll be better. And it turns out uh, we apply the oracle again, so now we're upside down. You see here we were from from zero to one, and now I, I flip it, so now we're from zero to negative one. No, no problem there. That's if, if I if I were to measure it now, we'll still get zero as the final answer. But I apply the inversion about the mean, and I've just undone all the work that I did earlier. So now we're back in in the equal superposition state. The phases are a little um, flipped here, but if I measure it, it's still a, a an equal chance of measuring every other answer, which means I've literally undone all the work I did earlier. So that's the consequence of of applying the Grover operation too many times, is you literally undo your work. Of course, if I applied it again, I could go back to my, you know, uh, back to my answer. But if you apply it again, uh, you better have a very stable quantum computer because the problem with quantum computing right now is errors creep in. So the first iteration, there's a little bit of error. And then I apply it again and again and again. And the error starts to build up to a point where you know, eventually your answer is just totally wrong. Just because the error creeps in, it builds up over time. And I also have, um, let's see, I have a section here on, on oracles. So, you know, I, I told you like, oh yeah, f of x, we can do some operation with f of x. Um, well, I have here the details, like, okay, you know, here's how you should think of them. And here's how, uh, oh, and I introduce you guys to uh, uncomputation. 
So occasionally the oracles will need some additional a working space, like an additional qubit or two. And those additional qubits don't con contribute to the final um, f of x, or they do contribute to the final f of x, but they, they're just kind of sitting there. It's almost like uh, when you're taking an exam and you need scratch paper. Think of it like scratch paper for the quantum computer. The problem is uh, that scratch paper gets reused again and again and again. And if there's old stuff on the scratch paper, the quantum computer is going to, it's gonna, it's gonna mess up your future results. So we have a procedure known as uncomputation. We can literally undo what we did earlier and reset the state of our qubit. And it, it, it's mathematically, it's a very simple idea, very elegant. Um, and I, uh, I hope my explanation is as equally elegant as well. Um, and, and of course, the, the sort of cherry on top here is I do have uh, an implementation, uh, in, excuse me, implementation so you will see, um, you know, what an actual oracle looks like on a quantum computer, and and um, you know how this um, how this whole thing works. And uh, you know, once again, if you, uh, I'm just I'm just giving you an overview of the notebook. The actual meat, uh, meat and potatoes are all um, in in the uh, in the LaTeX, which for some reason does not want to render properly on my computer. <laughs> so with that being said, um, yeah, that's that's sort of the end of what I have to present to you. Um, I encourage you to oh, let me give the URL here. Um, I don't know if you can, that's kind of tiny here. Maybe if I can zoom in, oh, that'll make, ah. or, you, or you can go on, on GitHub here and look for um, QC at Davis and you should see Grover's algorithm as one of the, um, one of the repositories. But uh, uh, in the meantime, if, you, if anyone has questions, uh, feel free to ask, like if, if the latex still doesn't render properly on, on North systems as well, let me know, I can push, um, I can push a fix for it.